Good morning. All right. Well, to make sure that you're awake, although by the way you just sang, I know you're awake, even if you don't feel like you're awake. Some of you don't even believe you're awake, but you are. Well, I, I, I would be doing injustice to all of you new campers if I did not show you what I look like in um, 1995. And that was Twin Day. In case that's not a good enough picture, here's a close-up for you. Um, so now you can understand about some of my issues and things like that. So, yes, I believe it was a borrowed bow tie, but uh, it was pretty. It was pretty cool. I wish I had it back. Well, this picture is a good segue into our word for the day, our final D word for the week, and our word today is different. <laughs> All right. Now, without looking around. I want to ask you a question. No, don't look around when I ask this question. You ready? How many of you know somebody that you would say is different? Ready. All right. I told you not to look around. Oh, you're looking at yourself. Yes. All right. I think we can all say we've met someone who's a little different. When I went to college, I went to Liberty University in, in, in Virginia, and when I got there, you know, I grew up in my whole life in New Jersey. I hadn't really spent any time, much time in the South. And I got there and met all kinds of different people. There's a guy in our hall named Phil. And Phil is from Georgia. Now, is anybody here from Georgia? All right, we're safe. Okay, I can talk about Georgia. Um, Phil was just a little bit different. He was a great guy. He was fun, but he was just a little bit different. And when you would run into Phil around campus, if he saw you coming, I mean, even if he was a long distance off, he would get a big smile on his face, and he would yell out, What's up, dog? <laughs> and I thought, wow. I have never met anyone like this. Because in New Jersey, we just don't yell out, what's up, dog, to people. So, we just don't do that. We say, how you doing? All right, there you go. The word different, it means not the same. It means unlike in nature. It means distinct. It means separate. Our, our theme verse this week has come from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, where Paul urges us. He says, I urge you, therefore, as a prisoner for serving the Lord, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. And what I want every one of you to get this week and throughout your life is that if you know Jesus as your Savior, He has called you into a relationship with Himself. He wants you to see Him for who He is, and He wants you to walk worthy, because you've seen Him for who He is, of His incredible calling on your life. And what I want you to realize is that if you do that, if you walk worthy of the calling that God's placed on your life, if you see God for who He is and you see your life the way God sees it and you adjust your life accordingly, you will live different. And so this morning I want to talk to you about living different. Jesus, one day in Luke chapter 9, and we were in Luke chapter 9 earlier this week, but in Luke chapter 9 verse 23, if you have your Bible, we're going to begin there and look at a few verses this morning. But in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says something that is pretty, pretty challenging, pretty emphatic, but it's also pretty exciting. And it says this, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says, He said to all. Now, you can underline all there. He said to everyone, to all. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And here Jesus issues an incredible challenge and an incredible invitation. And he gives that invitation to everyone. He says to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That was a pretty radical thing to say. If we were to place ourselves in the shoes, or if you will, the sandals of those who may have been listening to Jesus that day, when he said this, there would have been a few things that jumped out right away. First of all, he said anyone. A lot of people in Jesus' day had trouble believing that anyone could be a follower of God. The Pharisees thought that God and a relationship with God was reserved for good people and religious people or Jewish people only. Some people thought they were too sinful to have a relationship with God. And Jesus says, if anyone. And then he says, would come after me. And what's significant about that phrase is that in the original language, in the original context, that was a phrase that was often used to describe a romantic pursuit. 
And so if a guy was courting a girl, he would say, would you come after me? Because I'm coming after you. All right? You awake? All right. And what it is is an invitation to relationship. He says, if anyone would come after me, desire a relationship with me, he says, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. Then he says, take up your cross. And we might read over that kind of quickly, but in their minds, this would have been like right in your face because the cross was the most feared, dreaded form of execution. And to take up your cross meant that you were carrying your cross to your own execution. And Jesus says, you have to be willing to die to yourself. And then he says, you can follow me. I want you to realize it's not enough to believe the right things about God. You see, there are a lot of people that believe the right things about God. They believe God is the creator. They believe Jesus is the son of God. They believe he came. They believe he died. But it doesn't go any further than that. And it's not enough just to have an intellectual response. It's also not enough just to feel the right things about God and have an emotional response. God calls us to choose to embrace Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord, and be willing to lay aside our whole life in exchange for His. While He makes His grace available to all, He forces no one to follow Him. Look at what He said. He said, if. If. In the English language, we use the word if to introduce a conditional clause. He says, if you are willing to lay aside your life for mine and trust me in faith, and follow me with everything that you have and everything that you are, then I extend to you an opportunity to a relationship that will radically change your life. He says, come after me. You see, Jesus was inviting people to more than a religion. And following Jesus is not about being religious. It's about living in a relationship with the God of the universe. And he's made that available to, to you through his son who died on the cross for you. You've been invited to pursue God. Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, he says, there's no limitations. If you want to pursue God, he says, I call you to come to know me. Jesus died so that you could know him and live in a relationship with him. And here's the thing. We pursue things in life that we think are worth the time and the effort it takes to pursue them, don't we? Some of you are pursuing music. Most of you are pursuing music because you have realized that God's given you talents and gifts and abilities. And you realize, you know, practicing two hours a day, it's worth it because God's given me talent. I want to develop that talent and use that talent for the glory of God and His purposes. When I met my wife, I thought she was worth pursuing. All right, I saw her, I got to know her, and I said, I would like to be married to her. So I am going to pursue her. There were other guys pursuing her as well. All right, and I out-pursued them. <laughs> and I out-prayed them. <laughs> I knew I needed help. <laughs> All right, it was funny, but not that funny. <laughs> you see, Jesus calls you to examine him and to choose whether or not you believe he's worth pursuing. See, that's why I've been challenging you to see God for who he is, because I really believe that when you see God for who he is, when you see how great and holy and perfect he is, when you see how loving and gracious and kind and good and merciful he is, when you see who he is, you'll desire to know him and to experience relationship with him, and you'll be willing to lay aside anything to pursue that relationship. There's a short, short parable that Jesus tells. It's recorded for us in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's in chapter 13, and verse 44. In fact, it's really just one verse. But it's very, very insightful to help us understand what God's calling us to do. Jesus said this, Matthew 13, verse 44, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, then in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has and buys that field. How many of you have ever pretended to search for buried treasure? Anybody? All right. 
a lot of us. There's something that growing up, this idea of buried treasure, finding something is very intriguing. Well, in this parable that Jesus tells, basically he's telling the parable of a, of a farm worker who's out working in the field and throughout his work he uncovers some treasure. And this treasure is extremely valuable. And what would happen in, in this culture and in this time, often people would bury their valuable things to protect them, to hide them. And sometimes they would die before they retrieved them, or for whatever reason this treasure went unretrieved. And so this farm worker, he stumbles on some unretrieved treasure. So can you just kind of imagine, he's out there you know, working in the field, maybe digging with his shovel, and all of a sudden he hits something, he's like, hmm, what's this? He starts digging and he uncovers it and he opens it up and his jaw is in the ground. <laughs> there is more worth and value. There's more money than he's ever dared to dream or imagine. So what does he do? He looks around and he's like, no one's here. So he gets his shovel and he covers it back up and he smooths it over. And he just kind of goes throughout the rest of his day. But inside he is like anxious and excited. He goes home. He calls the realtor. He says, I want to put my house for sale. All right. He, he, he lists it on Zillow. He puts his donkey on Craigslist. All right, are you with me? I mean, he just is like, I'm selling everything because I am going to buy that field. Because if I buy that field, the treasure will be mine, legally. And so he, you know, has a big yard sale and the neighbors are coming by and they're like, man, oh, oh, you're moving somewhere? Why, why are you selling everything? I saw your donkey on Craigslist last night, you know. I, I put a bid on it, but I didn't get it. <laughs> and he says, well, um, you know, there's this field I, I really want to buy. And guys are like, you're selling your house? Your donkey? Your kids? Not, not really his kids, just kidding. <laughs> They're like, you're selling everything? Really? To buy a field? There's nothing in that field. They think he's crazy. And he knew that what was in the field was so much more valuable than anything that he had or owned. And he said, I'm willing to let go of and get rid of everything that I have to get what's in that field. To have that treasure. And of course, Jesus is telling us that this parable is about the kingdom of heaven. And he says, I want you to see that what I have and who I am and what I offer to you is more valuable than anything else this world has for you. And I want you to see the value of my kingdom. And I want you to be willing to lay aside everything and anything in order to pursue me and to follow me and to know me. I want you to see that who I am and what I have is more valuable than anything thing else. And if you do, and when you do, your life will be different, and people will think you're different, and people will think you're crazy. They'll think you're foolish. But until they understand the value of what's in the field, they'll never understand why you believe the way you do. Jesus is the only pathway to God. One of the great lies of our day one of the great, great deceptions that occurs over and over again is that there are many ways to God. That all you have to do is be sincere, or to have faith, or to believe. But Jesus said that he was the only way to God. That every other road merges onto the broad road of death and destruction. And every other pursuit, whether it be religious, or whether it be success, or money, they all merge onto the large road of destru destruction. In fact, this is what Jesus said. He says, you can enter God's kingdom... Only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and the gate is wide for the many who choose the easy way. But the gateway to life is small and the road is narrow and only few who will ever find it. Jesus is the narrow gate. He is, it's why he came to earth. It's why he taught. It's why he healed. It's why he loved. It's why he shared the message that he did. And ultimately it's why he died and rose again. And his cross today points to that narrow gate. And God says, I love you so much. I sent my son to die for you. I want you to see me for who I am. I want you to enter through that narrow gate and come into a living relationship with me through faith in my son who died and rose again for you. And then I want you to abandon everything to pursue me and to know me and to follow me. Only those who are willing to trade their life for Jesus will fully experience what he has for you. And I want you to know it's a good 
good trade. I want to quickly tell you the story about a young man who was born in 1887. His name was William Borden. Very few of you may recognize that name, probably not, but his family ran a very large and very successful dairy business. In fact, that business is still in business today. In fact, in the state of Florida, you can buy Borden milk. They sell it, I believe, in five or six states. You can find them on Facebook. They've been around a long time. Well, William was born in 1887, and of course, as being born into the family, it was expected that he would become part of the family business one day, and that he would be in that. And they were very wealthy, they were extremely well off, and so in 1905, William graduated high school, and his parents sent him on a trip around the world. Now, how many of you think your parents should do that for you when you graduate high school? All right. <laughs> Chances are they probably won't. And not because they don't want to, but trips around the world are quite expensive. So they sent William on this trip around the world, and he traveled many places, and he saw the world. And something happened in his heart while he was there. And when he came home from that trip, he realized, I am not called to the dairy business. God wants me to be a missionary. I want to take the gospel to the world. I want to take the good news that Jesus came and he died and he rose again to people who have never heard because he understood what the Bible said, that unless people hear the message of Christ, they can't believe. And if they don't believe, they will perish and spend an eternity far from God. And so William decided that he would forsake the dairy business and enter ministry. And so he wrote in his Bible... No reservations. He said, no reservations. I, I don't want to hold anything back from God. He went on to Yale University. He studied Bible there with other students. He graduated in 1909, and while he was there, he was very active in serving God. In fact, he started a Bible study that by the time he graduated, there were a thousand students involved in that weekly Bible study he had a passion to help the broken and the needy. He formed a home to help orphans, widows, and alcoholics. He called it the Yale Hope Mission. While he was in school, his father died. And he came to a place where his family forced him to make another decision. Are you going to come back and run the business? Or are you going to continue on? He already said, no reservations. I'm not going to hold anything back. And then he wrote in his Bible, no retreat. I'm not going to go back. Even though there's millions, or the equivalent of millions of dollars to be had and made, he says, what God has is more worthy than what I could follow here. He went on to seminary and trained for the mission field. In December of 1912, he sailed for Egypt on his way to China. He felt called to reach Muslims there in China. He went to Egypt to study language, but while he was there, he developed scarlet fever, and he died at the age of 25. When they recovered his belongings, one of the things that they found with his Bible, and in there they found those words, no reservations, no retreat, and then dated while he was ill and knew that he was dying, these last two words, no regrets. No regrets. You see, William Borden was somebody who was able to say no reservations, no retreat, no regrets. He never made it to the mission field that he thought God called him to, but his life has impacted thousands of people. His life impacted people at Yale. His story still impacts and inspires people today. He saw his Savior as being more worthy than anything else in life, more worthy than career, more worthy than comfort, more worthy than his family, more worthy than the temporary inheritance of riches. Jesus said this. He said, The kingdom of heaven... Is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, in his joy, you see what this said? It, it was his joy to sell everything that he had because he saw the value and the worth of who God is. And I want you to know that following God completely wholeheartedly, it is joy. It's not always easy. For William, it wasn't easy. In fact, it cost him his life. But there was no sorrow in it. And in his joy, he went and he sold all that he had. And so this morning, I just want to ask you this question. What value do you place on Jesus? What value do you place on Jesus? 
Because the answer to that question will determine the extent that you choose to pursue Him and to follow Him in life. And I want to challenge you to see Jesus as being more valuable than anything else in life. And He's worth pursuing above everything else in life. When I got married, I made a vow. Before God, before my family, and before many of my friends. And in that vow, I said something to the extent that I was now forsaking all others. And what I meant was not only was I choosing to commit my life to my wife, but I was choosing to say no to everyone else. That from now on, until our marriage ended by death of either one of us, that we were choosing to say no to everyone else. And you see, following Jesus requires you to say no to anything else. He's invited you, He's called you, and He wants you to come. He says, if anyone, that's you, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter your past, He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And here's the thing, because I know there's a huge tension here. And I knew there's a huge part of our hearts that wrestled, because guess what? I was there. I wrestled with this. I felt God calling me this way when I was a camper here. And it took me three years to wrestle with this. And I don't want it to take you three years, because those three years were not fun, and they were not comfortable, and they were not easy. Jesus says, if you're thinking that the cost is too great and maybe you just want to hold on to your life, he says, remember this. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. And how do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose or forfeit your own soul in the process? I want to call you to live a life of no reservations, of no retreat, and no regrets. And here's the one thing I can tell you. If you live a life of no reservation and no retreat, you will live a life of no regrets. You will never come to the end of your life and say, I regret giving my life to God. I regret how I served Him. I regret how I loved Him. I regret how I followed Him. You'll never, ever regret that. And I don't want any of you to live a life of regret. I don't want to see any of you grow up and, and look back and say, you know what, I could have done so much for God. I could have given my life early. You have an incredible opportunity because you're young. You have your whole life in front of you. Give it to God. He's worthy. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the most valuable treasure that exists. Being a follower of Christ is not about wearing a label. It's about living a life that's completely different than the world calls you to. And so my challenge to you today is to live worthy of the calling that God's put on your life. You've been called by God. Will you live different? Will you live different? Let me pray for you this morning. As we did yesterday, just before we pray, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, just not looking around, just giving everyone privacy, but how many of you would say this morning that with God's help and God's grace, I want to live differently when I go home and that I want to put God first in my life? Just, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? Thank you. So, there's so many of you. Thank you. And you know what? It's true for my life as well because Jesus says you have to take up your cross daily. This is a daily thing for every person that raised their hand this morning, so many of them. And God, you saw their hands, you see their hearts. And God, I just pray for them this morning that by your grace and by your power and through your spirit that you would give them the ability to live out that commitment. And God, I pray that you take their lives and use them in incredible ways to accomplish your purposes, to help your kingdom be established. And Father, to bring the gospel to a world that desperately needs to know about you.